um, to Muslims since 9-11, and that's how I got involved in this issue um, through the case of Yassin Araf and Muhammad Hussein. And Yassin, as you may know, was the imam of the Masjid al-Salam on Central Avenue in Albany, and Muhammad Hussein was um, a member of the mosque, a co-founder of the mosque, and they were set up in an incredibly unfair and crazy sting operation by the FBI using a criminal informant named Shahed Hussein, who then went on to become even more well-known and infamous in the Newberg case, where he offered $250,000 to a guy who didn't want anything to do with it, and then said, oh, okay, for $250,000, he's in, which um, was described as a murder for hire plot, not a sting operation. But anyway, here in Albany, he um, and the FBI were able to get convictions of two holy innocent men just basically for being Muslim. Yassin didn't even know that there was anything going on with this alleged plot. He thought it was a normal loan. And they very, in a very, very complicated way, um, tricked him and inserted phrases into the tapes that, that were recorded that he didn't even hear or know what they were talking about. And I could go on about that for a long time, but I won't. I'll just say that um, we have a table in the back there at the Muslim Solidarity Committee table. And you can read more about it on our website, projectsalam.org, and other places. And there's a couple of books rounded up that Shamshad Ahmad, the president of the mosque, who's here tonight, somewhere around here, right there, in front. Um, he wrote this really great book explaining the case. And also Yassin Araf wrote a book called Son of Mountains. And one of the things that we did in the Muslim Solidarity Committee, which we came together um, after the convictions um, to try to advocate for these men and their families and for the Muslim community. Um, one of the things we did was set up a fund to support the families because there's um, 10 children, 10 young children um, that were left without a means of support and the wives too um, through this uh, case. And um, so we've been paying the rent for Yassin's family um, and basically doing what we can to help out and the mosque has been helping out a lot and um, so we're having a raffle tonight of two of Vijay's books back there on the table, the Uncle Swami book and what's the other? Um, Arab, Arab Spring. Spring, Libyan Winter, another new book that he just published. Um, so if you could help and buy a raffle ticket, the proceeds will go to help the families of Yasina Muhammad. Um, and I'm happy to be introducing Vijay. Vijay Prashad is the George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian History and Professor of International Studies at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He's the author of 14 books. Um, um, two of his most well-known books, Karma of Brown Folk in 2000 and Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting in 2002 were chosen by the Village Voice as Books of the Year. His book, the Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World from 2007 was chosen as the best nonfiction book by the Asian American Writers Workshop in 2008 and it won the Muzaffar Ahmed Award, Book Award in 2009. His, um, in 2012 it says he will publish five books, I don't know how you do that. I know that a couple of them are already published up there, um, including these two books that are raffling, uh, that we're raffling tonight, Arab Spring, Libyan Winter, and Uncle Swami, South Asians in America Today, which he's going to be talking about tonight, although he may also be talking about some very recent events. Mm -hmm. um, he writes regular, oh, in, I'm sorry, in 2013, he has another book coming out called The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, which sounds interesting. So maybe you can tell us a little bit, of, I don't know how much time we'll have, but I'm curious about that. Um, Vijay writes regularly for Counterpunch, Frontline, and other publications. And he's a regular commentator on Democracy Now! and the Real News Network. He was on Democracy Now! something like yesterday? Or the day, before. day before yesterday. All right, welcome, Thank Vijay. You. Thanks, John, for inviting me back uh, for the James Connolly Forum. Uh, resident of Troy, Irish revolutionary. Uh, so many good things about James Connolly. Maybe you should make a booklet about him for the forum. Uh, talk about his Troy days. I keep forgetting last time John told me things, but I don't remember 
exactly. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things, and they're all interconnected. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk briefly about is, of course, the events in North Africa, and actually around the globe today. Uh, vast protests around the globe. I'd like to try to start with that, to put it in context, to talk a little bit about you know, how the corporate media has a very tough time dealing with Islam. So that will be the first thing. The second thing I'm going to talk about uh, is the problem that we have of thinking through what it means to have lived as somebody who looks like a terrorist in the United States after 9-11. That will be the second, as it were, thing. You know, what does it mean to be in the skin of somebody who is forever going to be mistaken as dangerous? So that's the second thing. And the third thing, I'm going to read the opening section of Uncle Swami. And it's great for me to have Linda and Julie here. So let's see uh, how crazy you may see. <laughs> All right. On Wednesday, there was a big demonstration in Cairo. The demonstration took place in the evening. It's complicated to know exactly what happened. Some people are now saying that the pro-Mubarak TV stations in Cairo began to run stories about a very bizarre, minor little thing that's on the internet. And others are saying, as I said earlier, that it was more the Salafi satellite channels like Al Nas that ran you know, stories about this 13-minute trailer of a film. Not really a film. It's a piece of garbage. <laughs> Those of you who've seen it, I, you know, it's not even, there's nothing aesthetic about it. It's a piece of garbage. But it's not that people were watching this, but it touched a spark. And there was a major demonstration in Cairo. The demonstration broke the bounds of the embassy wall. News of that came to Benghazi. And Benghazi is very volatile, as I'll talk about, on these things. And there, there were only four Libyans guarding the embassy, the consulate. So it's not like it took a lot of effort to break through. The ambassador was there to meet the oil company. Adam, you know, the Libyan oil company has its headquarters in Benghazi, and that's what he had come for a meeting for. People didn't know that he was there. This is not quite the assassination of an ambassador. It was accidental in that sense. There was great violence against the embassy, against the consulate. There was the use of RPGs. I'll come back to how this could be. How, at a protest, do people show up with heavy automatic weapons and RPGs? You know, what kind of protest is this? Some people say, you know. So there was that. And then the ambassador and some members of his staff were being taken to a safe house. And somehow they, they were interdicted in the middle. And he was killed, not there, in the hospital he died. That's stage one. Stage two, demonstrations in Sana'a in Yemen. Then today, demonstrations around the world, including, to my mind, very interesting in Srinagar in Kashmir, in North India. Why is that interesting? That was not a demonstration that is unrecognizable. Because the lawyers from the high court walked out and joined the demonstration. Shopkeepers joined the demonstration. So why demonstration against something? So I want to make two or three points just to help us understand what this something is. And then I'll talk about the media. What are those two or three things? The first thing that I'd like you to recognize is that it's not the film. Most people had not seen the film. Just as in 2005, most people had not seen the cartoon denigrating Muhammad in the Danish newspaper. Just as in 1989, most people had not read the Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. It's not the point of that actual artifact. It's what that artifact is supposed to have suggested that was hurtful to people. Now, some people immediately say, oh my god, grow up. It's a free world. People can say anything, blah, blah, blah. And I say, wait a minute. The first point I'm trying to make is, it is human to be hurt by certain things. Now, for instance, there was an artist in the United States who did a very disturbing set of images of Christ. 
Christ pissing. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. 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 It affected a lot of people. People were outraged by that. People thought it was horrible what was being done. When somebody paints a swastika next to a synagogue, people are outraged by that, correct? Mm -hmm. It's just a symbol. Grow up. Why are you getting so excited? Why are there demonstrations? It's just a symbol. No. Human beings react strongly when they feel their dignity compromised. Somebody says something nasty about somebody in my family. I will be angry because I know they are not just words. We all react strongly to symbols that the media totally missed. Because they once again portray this as the crazy Arab. It is easy for them to say, look at these Muslims, they have thin skin. They are so easily riled up. They move to violence, etc. Forget, let's forget Romney for a second. Because that reaction was simply juvenile. <laughs> it's not a humane reaction to say, all speech is free, you must not appease. You must not appease. One second. If somebody desecrates your beliefs, you will be outraged. If somebody insults you, you will not take it quietly. That's the first thing. This was a human reaction. This was not a Muslim reaction. Okay, that's the first point. Second point. In, after the Second World War, there was an enormous feeling of relief across North Africa, through West Asia, into the bulk of Asia, and in sections of Latin America. Why? The relief came from the following that finally the yoke of 200 years of colonial rule is ended. You know, it was enormous sense of feeling. Remember, after World War I, there was a promise when the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Wilson declared the 14 points. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be no more colonialism. Mm -hmm. Then people went to the Peace of Paris. The hope was that West Asia, freed now from the Ottoman yoke, would be able to create independent states. But no, at the Peace of Paris, Wilson colluded with the French and the English with their so-called Sykes-Picot plan to divide up the old Ottoman vilayats. The English will get Iraq. The English will get Transjordan. They will divide up Lebanon from Syria. Syria will go to the French. Lebanon will be divided. Balfour will give his declaration for Palestine. This was a huge betrayal for people. But after World War II, an opening comes. There is Nasser. There is a feeling, especially after the coup d'etats in Iraq in 58, that new openings are going to be possible. That created a huge pent-up demand for freedom, enormous demand for freedom. By the 1970s, that experiment had run, up, run its course. In Iran, the experiment was not even allowed to begin. Mohammed Mossadegh wins his election in 1951. But then he tries to nationalize the oil. And he moves against mainly British interests, some American interests, and the interests of a very curious Armenian gentleman called Mr. Gulbenkian. Nobody's heard of him. He was known in his day as Mr. 10%, because he got 10% of the oil profits in <laughs> Iran. <laughs> okay, he was no, he was Mr. Ten Mr. Ten percent now is a very modest number <laughs> because some people we know yeah. among our one percent are Mr. Fifty percent. Right. They are not content with ten percent. Ten percent is nothing. But Gulbenkian made ten percent of Iranian oil proceeds. Mossadegh disenfranchised all of them. 1953, the grand nephew of FDR, who fashioned himself as a man of peripathetic mystery. He liked the nickname Kim after the Rudyard Kipling novel. <laughs> you know, Kim, but his real name was Kermit. <laughs> if your name Kermit, Kermit you would pick Roosevelt. Kim any day over Kermit. <laughs> Kermit Kim Roosevelt shows up in Tehran, and for $1 million, the cheapest coup, by the way, per capita, the cheapest coup in world history, per capita. And not to speak of the dollar profit advantages that accrued afterwards, yeah. but still, just per capita, for $1 million, 
He engineered the overthrowing of the Mossadegh government. Mm -hmm. And you get the Shah coming into Iran. And by the way, today, if you talk to Iranian intellectuals, their history begins with two things, two words, Mossadegh and Reuters. Because Reuters, Mr. Reuters of Reuters News, in the earlier generation, suckered the Iranians. You know, in the 1910s, when they had the Majlis movement in 1906, the parliamentary movement. Iran has a very old history of parliamentary democracy. But this had to be stopped. So whereas the Arab world at least had a chance 20 years of opening up space for its politics, Iran was cut at the knees in 1953. And you know, today, if you look at the world from the Iranian point of view, it's very different than what, how the New York Times sees history. They start with 1953. Right. And unfortunately, most people in the United States don't even know who Mossadegh was. So therefore, we don't actually understand why the Iranians are suspicious at every turn. We think they're suspicious because they're Muslims. Because Muslims not only have thin, thin skin, they're also suspicious people. They're not trustworthy. You understand? Saturated with stereotypes because we've forgotten our own history. That is our own history with the Middle East. So by the 1970s, through in huge infusions of Saudi money, because the Saudis played an active role with the West here in undermining Nasserism. And by the way, Nasserism did its own undermining. It didn't need much undermining by the Saudis and others, but it did. From the 70s to the present, there has been a real sense in the Middle East, an increasing sense of subordination in world historical terms. We don't have a place in the world, is the sentiment. It takes very small things to trigger that sentiment upward and outward. Now, this film which nobody will have watched, previously a cartoon, and before that, a novel, which very few people had read. It had not been translated into Arabic, not been translated into Farsi. You know, people had not read it. What they were protesting against was not a, a novel, not a cartoon, not a film. There have not been protests against the root of what they are angry about, which is subordination. But they pick these things to protest about. Mm -hmm. And then it gets characterized simply as religious protest. People are not able to see that it's much more deeper than just religion, merely religion. This is also a protest about how people see themselves through other people's eyes. What people are saying is, why are you looking at me like that? Don't look at me like that. Don't subordinate me in the way you stare at me. OK? That's the second contextual thing. The third contextual thing, just Benghazi now, Libya. Forget the rest of the world. Forget the fact that today in Tunisia, five people were shot dead in the protest. Forget the fact that in Sudan, a group tried to rush into the German embassy. You know, in other words, it's not just a Benghazi story, although the media is going to make this just about who killed the ambassador. This is a world story. There were demonstrations everywhere. But let's leave all that. Let's just come to Benghazi. This is not the first time in Benghazi that there has been such a demonstration. There was one in 2006. And see the ironies of history. And you appreciate. We can talk about this in the Q&A later. Here's the ironies of history. Gaddafi comes to power in 1969. Totally popular coup. Overthrows King Idris. Highly unpopular regime, the king's regime. It's very popular, not one gunshot is fired. I talked to people who were in the US Embassy in 69, in, in Tripoli, and they said, yeah, it was totally popular coup. Nobody has any doubt about that. His reforms, first 10 years, very impressive. You know, he has no idea how to do politics. He has no idea how to be democratic. But he turns over the oil wealth to the people for the first 10 years. Then, because of the sanctions regime, regime suffocated he wants to make a deal with the West. And he needs to cut away the opposition against him. So who is the principal opposition? The principal opposition that emerges in Libya is in the vocabulary of Islam and Islamism, especially in eastern Libya. And he goes after them ferociously. In 1996, there is a group, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. They uh, start a small set of rebellions in eastern Libya largely, but also one in Tripoli itself. There are these small rebellions. Gaddafi crushes them. And in Abu Salim prison, 
His interior minister, Abdullah Sansusi and others, they engineer the shooting massacre of hundreds of people inside the prison. Keep that in mind, that's 96. In 2006, on February 17th, in response to the Danish cartoon controversy of the previous year, November 2005, so in 17th February 2006, there is a large demonstration outside the Italian consulate in Benghazi. Why the Italian consulate? Two reasons. One, Italy was the colonial power in, in Libya. That is why you know, there is so much in Libya that you look at the shadows of Mussolini's egotistical grandiosity. You know. <laughs> Napoleon, I mean, he was like the Napoleon of Second World War. That was one. Secondly, a minister in Berlusconi's government, Roberto Calderoni, wore on television a t-shirt with the cartoon on it. So they were demonstrating in front of the Italian consulate. Gaddafi sent his troops in. They opened fire, killed 11 people. 17 February 2006. OK, now the rebellion begins in Tunisia in actually December of 2010. Gaddafi goes on Libyan state television. You can watch this on YouTube. I write about it in Arab Spring, Libyan winter. He goes on Libyan state television and he starts giving this crazy speech and he denounces Kleenex. <laughs> there should not be Kleenex. What he means, of course, is WikiLeaks. <laughs> it's, it's not the Kleenex. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was once at a a rally in the United States in the 1990s where a, you know, a left-wing leader was talking about the necessity of national hair care. <laughs> he, was, he was trying to say health care, but in the moment of the speech. And I thought, you know, you get a good haircut, everybody gets it. <laughs> Kleenex must be. <laughs> Gaddafi said, on the 15th of February in Benghazi, the regime arrested a group of civil libertarians, lawyers, one of them Fatih Terbil, <coughs> middle class people who had been radicalized by the shooting five years previously in 2006. They thought it's unconscionable that any regime would shoot protesters demonstrating outside a consulate. So they had been radicalized. They also then took up the cases of the people killed in Abu Salim prison. The, however many people had been killed in the prison. They were representing their families. Two days before the planned five-year anniversary demo in Benghazi, the Gaddafi regime arrested these three or four organizers for the February 17th demo. This is, as I'm trying to say, a separate history than the Arab Spring. It just came together. There was a demonstration outside the jail saying, release Terbil and others. And there will Salwa, the other person, release them all. No. Big demo. Within one week, Gaddafi lost a third of the country. Mm. Now, what I'm just trying to, why I'm saying all this is Benghazi has a history. After the NATO intervention, something striking happened. There were if you don't mind this, there were two sets of Libyan diasporics that played a leadership role in the rebellion against Gaddafi. One set were the people who were educated, most of them educated in the United States, engineering colleges, many of them, like Mahmoud Jibril, the first head of the National Transitional Council, like Al Qib, the first prime minister, like Mustafa Abu Shugur the newly elected prime minister, all ele you know, they did engineering college in Alabama and you know, different places, and they taught here for a while. Several of them had been involved in anti-Gaddafi organizing, but in a kind of, you know, political way. They had correspondence societies, things like that. Jibril made his career in the Gulf. He was, for instance, the financial advisor to the second wife of the Emir of Qatar. These are all important top people in their own way. Moment the rebellion began, they come to, and when one third of Libya goes to the rebellion, they arrive in Benghazi and set up the National Transitional Council. 
they have no mass base in Libya. Their mass base was in NATO headquarters. And they were greatly advantaged by the intervention. Because the second lot of diasporics were people who had been either in the same group that were killed in Abu Salim prison in 1996, or who had very subsequently joined that group. That was the Libyan Islamic fighting group. And they disappeared out of Libya because the repression was intense. Where did they go? They went to Saudi Arabia, they went to Chechnya, they went to Afghanistan, they went to Pakistan. Wow. Now, they were out of reach of the Gaddafi regime. This is also important to remember. Gaddafi did not have the capacity to find them. Earlier in the 70s, he had sent his aide, Musa Kusa, to London to hunt down what they call stray dogs. And then Musa Kusa was ejected from London. And if you want, his story is fantastic. Because why is Musa Kusa, the real butcher of the Gaddafi regime in the second half, why is he living in a comfortable bungalow in Doha, Qatar? That's a question. Wow. He's never going to face charges anyway. Well, that's a separate, well, who cares about it? <laughs> okay, because he helped the CIA and MI6 do something specific. After 9-11, the Gaddafi regime said to the United Americans, you and I have a common enemy. I am willing to open my prisons. You can bring anybody you want here. We'll torture them for you. This is part of the so-called black sites, the extraordinary rendition program. As long as you help me bring back my guests, I need them back. But 10 days ago, Human Rights Watch released a superb report which detailed the stories of the extraordinary rendition of Libyans, members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. One of them, Belhaj, who is, you know, played a hugely important role in the military campaign against Gaddafi. Belhaj was arrested with his wife, who was at the time four months pregnant in Malaysia. They were then taken to Thailand, where they, were, they claimed they were tortured by the CIA. Then they were chained on a plane and his wife, four months pregnant, was chained to the side of the plane to fly them to Libya, where they were, where Belhaj was greeted by Musa Kusa, who's now living in this seaside villa in Doha, Qatar. And Musa Kusa's first words when he walked into the cell, Belhaj is chained, was, I've been waiting for you. Now, many of them were sent back like that. For reasons that I explain in my book, many of them were released in an amnesty, 2008, 2009. There was amnesty conducted. It was a deal. It's a complicated deal, but anyway. When the rebellion begins, these are the people who galvanize and organize those young folk on Toyota trucks. Because they have military experience. Their diasporic life was different. They were not teaching at the University of Alabama in civil engineering. <laughs> these guys were in the mountains in Chechnya fighting against the Russians. They are battle hardened. They went and fought. Once Gaddafi fell, they were not going to give up their weapons because they understand betrayal. They understand they were not going to have a political role here. The political scene was totally cooked to facilitate the top level diaspora. Jibril, you know, they are handing over power one from the next. They look like elections, but it went from Jibril to El Kib and now to Abu Shagur. They're all friends, they've been in this network since the 1970s together. It looks like democracy, but really it's within one group of people. These people have been left out. Among these people who have been left out, there is one section that is getting even more radicalized. Now, somebody said that the government believes that this is revenge for the killing of Al Libi, number two in Al Qaeda, killed in Waziristan. That was put out there. First thing you should know is that the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group hates Al Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is not like, it doesn't own all franchises of militant political Islam. They hate Al-Qaeda. Why? Because they say, you're crazy. Why do you keep trying to poke your eye into the American face? We want to deal with Gaddafi. We don't want to fight with America. They thought 9-11 was an insane thing. Why are you provoking America? We don't have any quarrel with America. Our quarrel is with Gaddafi. That was how they saw things. We want to take on Gaddafi. This is just going to, you know, bring us unnecessary wrath. So they don't have truck with Al-Qaeda. That's the first thing about the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. There are sections, of course, that are attracted to similar ideology, but institutionally they are not interested in that strategy. 
one has to make distinctions. Otherwise, if everything is the same, you have to bomb everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible for this to have been a retaliation, full, you know, for that tape. Why? Al Qaeda cannot organize a mass demonstration in Cairo. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Al Qaeda cannot organize a mass demonstration in Srinagar. Impossible. It cannot pull lawyers out of a building in the High Court to come to a demonstration. Impossible. Al Qaeda doesn't appeal to these people. This is another history. I'm afraid that here, once again, the State Department and government are going to demonstrate. They don't see that foreign policy has to be con seen consequentially. Every action has a reaction. If once again you bomb in eastern Libya, it's going to radicalize people more. So what is your strategy? What is your grand strategy in dealing with the Arab world? So let's leave that there. Let me switch a little bit now to the media's difficulty with all this, OK? Is that OK so far? Story is coming together. Media doesn't get any of this. Media sees everything in very simple terms. First, Gaddafi, bad guy. When the bad guy is overthrown, the good people come in. Because they're just waiting to be, you know, Americans. If the Libyans were free, they would want freeways and malls, and they would be just like you and me. But we are not like you and me. I met, met people in the United States that I'm not like at all. I don't share the same aspirations. I don't want to get, you know, obscenely wealthy. I don't want to, you know, have six houses and elevators for my cars. And I don't want all that stuff. I don't want to keep my animals on top of my car. That's not what I want with my life. People don't all, you know, have the same desires. It's much the same way in the Arab world. There's not like this suppressed Arab population that when the dictator goes, they suddenly are grateful. And you know, no, they have different political views that the media totally didn't prepare us for. Because they said, well, the Arab Spring has come, leaders are gone, everything's great. No, wait a minute. There's a political fight happening there. And in Libya, for instance, it's a fight between these different political tendencies. Who is going to control the new state? Who is going to control the constitution? Same fight happening in Egypt. The constitution is going to be written. Who gets to dominate the constituent assembly? It's a big fight. Different groups are organized to have that fight. So that's one thing the media totally missed. Second thing, I went back and I read one of my favorite books from Edward Said called Covering Islam. It's a great book because you know Edward very simply basically tells you that if you just start with the premise that Muslims are crazy, you're not going to understand anything. You know, if you start with the premise that people in the Arab world are irrational, you might as well not even take the next step. You're not going to understand a thing. So if you start with the premise that Arabs are rational or that Arabs are irrational, you lose either way. Because guess what? We are not either rational or irrational. We are too complicated to be that simple. I, myself, I'm not sure whether at any given moment I'm going to behave rationally or irrationally. <laughs> we oscillate and find ourselves somewhere in between, even in our own lives. So why do we expect an entire people to behave you know, rationally or irrationally, whatever? Our expectations are enormous. For instance, a man walks into a Gurdwara in Wisconsin, in Oak Creek, opens fire. The papers around the world didn't say, Christians are crazy. Christians are insane. We need to have psychotherapy for Christianity. <laughs> you know, nobody says that. They say this guy is an insane guy or whatever. Now, you can say that certain things are also politically produced. So I would say that, yes, it's true, that the cleric establishment sometimes in Egypt, rather than actually turning the face of the country, towards the genuine problems. Like for instance, Mohammed Morsi's government in Egypt is now negotiating with the IMF for a big loan. And they're negotiating the so-called debt reduction deal with the Americans. Mm -hmm. See, if people, if the clerics, if the Brotherhood understood economics, on Friday, why didn't they give a speech denouncing the IMF deal? You understand what I'm saying? Why don't they talk about what is going to actually destroy further the Egyptian economy? 
but it's so much easier to just talk about culture to say this these movies yeah. so there is a production of a narrowing of the social vision so you expect the demonstration to be about the movie and not the IMF you know package now look at our side we have Pam Geller we have all these lunatics talking about how can we have a mosque in lower Manhattan you know we have all this language about Sharia law in America Sharia law in America you crazy <laughs> nobody's talking about Sharia law in America you know where's this coming from you know it's going to be do you want Sharia law in America I mean what are we talking I mean I live in Massachusetts you know there's barely any personal laws anymore everything is allowed now what Sharia law are you talking about you know, you know it's insane how this idea comes Sharia law what that produces is a certain promiscuity towards being offensive against Islam or Muslims just as the clerics are not talking about the IMF loan but talking about these movies things like that in the same way I find here instead of talking about the fact that no political party has any idea how to deal with the situation of endemic collapse of jobs none of them have a clue how to do anything about the jobs problem you know and we can go into that if you want they have no clue no agenda at all none of them basically it's all tinkering with the collapse they are sitting on the Titanic they're not even rearranging the deck chairs <laughs> they've decided to paint the grand ballroom <laughs> people below the decks you know you do whatever the hell you want you fight over the lifeboats we are going to paint the grand ballroom because you may start sinking but we'll be dancing till forever I mean they have no clue but it's so much easier to talk about this other stuff you know to rile people up on these what here I think they I like the term they call a wedge issue okay so the media is not prepared us at all in fact does a great disservice it lacks I think the imagination to see how complicated the world is and how similar all of us are in our reaction to this global catastrophe of mm -hmm. endemic joblessness mm -hmm. just as they are petrified in North Africa of economies that are just sinking faster than people can swim upward we are also getting increasingly petrified about the future mm -hmm. there is no hope on the horizon Fine. but rather than acknowledge this similarity they raise the flag of difference and say look at them they are burning the embassy barbarians once again okay so that's the media fine thirdly so last year I was covering the uh, Libyan war for counterpunch mainly little bit Asia times I wrote the book book is done meanwhile I was doing this other book this has been with me since 2001 in the year 2000 I wrote a book which was called the karma of brown folk which essentially was about South Asian migrants in the United States and the question of race and I suggested there that one of the great tricks of the American ideology is to play a perverse game with minorities so the suggestion used to be that you know why should we give welfare aka why should one help African Americans and Latinos particularly look at the Asians they're doing so great okay that was the story and we, there's a joke you know it's a model minority well you know just a second there is a history to this Asians were not allowed into the United States to migrate between 1924 and 1965 those Asians that came before 1924 built California along with Mexican Americans you know uh, migrant workers from Oklahoma you know etc they're the ones who laid, made California agricultural uh, you know Japanese farmers Indian farmers this that you go to the inner valleys of California and those are the communities you see their shadows because after all the Japanese were removed from there and they were sent to very nice places to sit out the war in sort of hotels called internment camps I was reading a book recently that really talked about how it was justified as like for their own good and you know classic things anyway but people lost their property many people lost their property lost their, anyway forget all that 
suddenly in 65, there was a demographic problem. Soviets were booming. They had sent a rocket to space. My God, they had sent a man into space, Yuri Gagarin. Then they sent a woman into space, Valentina, what's her last name? Jovichkova. Jovichkova? Yeah. yeah. Valentina Jovichkova, very good, yeah. <laughs> and Gagarin and Valentina, Yuri and Valentina, right. and, and then the dog Laika before that, yeah. right? So what were the hell are they doing? They're winning the arms race, is that? There were major debates in the United States, what's happening to our education system? And you may remember, some of you may remember that in schools they started the math B, mm -hmm. math clubs, yeah. you know, got to make studying hip again. Yeah. No more leather jackets for the boys and girls and smoking and hair pushed back and yeah. got to get them to study. Well, they were not studying. <laughs> They're not enough scientists. So guess what, 1965 act. We're going to bring in highly skilled workers from around the world. 83% of the South Asians that migrate to the United States between 65 and 77, 83% came with advanced degrees. So what I had argued in that book is that, look, this whole model minority thing is nonsense. It's got nothing to do with natural selection. It's state selection. You're comparing a population that has lived here much longer you know, brought here in some cases in captivity. In others, their land was overrun, meaning the Southwest. They were already there, but their lands were overrun. You're comparing them to a population that comes here with a PhD. I mean, it's a perverse, the comparison is racist. That was my argument. Well, so I went to Washington DC three weeks, four, you know, two months after 9-11 to a book festival, and I was talking about that book, and, and a man from India stood up and said, listen, it's all very well you say, say that. Now, we are getting deported. Ah. And what do you say about that? After 9-11, there was special registration of people from certain countries. I mean, I remember I was teaching in New York that semester, and I remember I start the book with the story, almost started, uh, I remember going to New York and two or three times that semester, just after Stanford, the train would stop at these small stations, which they didn't stop. And everybody, and then the, the, some kind of security would walk through the, I don't know what they were. They were not police, I don't know what they were, but they were heavily armed. They would walk through and they would ask certain people to get on the platform. And I remember three times I went on the platform and they ask you all these questions and they check your backpack and I'm thinking, you know, what is, like, I don't know, maybe it made people feel safer. But sometimes, ironically, after 9-11, when I especially was taking a, a flight and I'm sitting in that waiting area <laughs> and I would sometimes stare at the guard saying, please pull me aside and check me again because these other passengers are staring at me. And if you do a full body search right here, it'll make them more comfortable. I have a good flight. <laughs> Please don't take, you know, somebody, you know, that's 80 years old and everybody stares at me thinking, why are they humiliating her? They should be humiliating you. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was a general experience of everybody who sort of looked like a terrorist. And they were all these I remember one day in Chicago, I spoke at an anti-war rally this is before the Iraq war. And I get to the airport and I was taken aside. It was the most mysterious experience by these two guys in blue suits. And you know those doors in the airport, you don't know where they go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So they open this door and they take me in there and I spend an hour and they ask me questions like, who did you meet in Chicago? And what were you doing here? Who invited you? And, you know, I, and at some point, I think two or three times in that con conversation, I wanted to ask them, can I see your badge? Who are you? What agency do you represent? But I never had the nerve to ask anything. It's a little bit like the mundane problem when you get pulled over on the freeway yeah, yeah. and the officer comes to the window and says, license and registration. How many of you say, what's the reason for you pulling me over? <laughs> oh, well, well, you have that hat on, so you get away with it. <laughs> the rest of us are sheep. We just hand over everything and say, you want to search my trunk? Click, here it is. You know. Our uh, personal, I guess it's convenience too, you know, you know that to demand your rights, yeah. it's inconvenient. Right. It's like friends of mine who say, I don't want to stand in that thing. Then it takes like half an hour. They have to bring somebody special, yeah. they take you to a special room, you know. It's like, 
it's inconvenient to demand rights. Right. It's so much more convenient to be sheep. Right. See. So anyway, these things were mundane questions. And it got me thinking really seriously about how did we react after 9-11? And then how does one react right through, through today? You know, how, how do you live in this madness where people are afraid? And I don't even know they know what they're afraid of. You know, what do you expect? Like, you know, do you expect that in some faraway town in America, in the middle of North Dakota, that there's going to be a terrorist attack? I mean, which terrorist has even heard of you? you know, which terrorist is interested in coming to your small town and you know, killing anybody? You know, they're going to attack New York City, not you. So why are you afraid? You know, why are people in? Places that you know are not going to ever be targets, terrified. Why does this fear enter the soul? And it's, some of it has to do with a very poor understanding of what happened at 9-11. Right. You know, what was that about? And unfortunately, any attempt to try and explain mm -hmm. how it happened was construed as justifying it. So for instance, everything I just said about the Benghazi incident can be construed as you are justifying it. You're saying it's OK that they fired at the, the consulate. If I say that Al-Qaeda's roots begin when the United States decide to send its military into Saudi Arabia in 1990, when Saddam Hussein enters Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And you know, that has to be placed in the lap not of George H.W. Bush but on Jimmy Carter. Because after all, it was Jimmy Carter who enunciated the Carter Doctrine. You know, one of the things that the right wing in America has got wrong is this idea that Jimmy Carter was somehow a peacenik. Uh -huh. You know, Jimmy Carter's Carter Doctrine actually trapped the United States. Anybody knows the Carter Doctrine? Yeah, Carter Doctrine? The defense of the realm of Saudi Arabia is equivalent to the defense of the, of the United States. <laughs> That's the Carter Doctrine. It's a very sim elegant doctrine. If the Saudis say we are under threat, the United States has to help Saudi Arabia. In other words, who are we helping? We are helping a tyrannical monarchy survive, which is why we allowed the tyrannical monarchy of the Saudis to enter Bahrain on the 14th of March last year and crush the rebellion there. We had to wink and look the other way because of the Carter Doctrine. Because the Saudis said the rebellion in Bahrain is a threat to the realm of Saudi Arabia. When the troops entered, that creates Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was furious. The people who become Al-Qaeda were furious about the presence of so-called you know, non-believer troops in the Holy Land. Whatever. That's the understanding. But I think we didn't understand 9-11. We understood it as senseless, random violence. Now, to say that it has a logic is not to say that it was a good thing. But there was so much pressure on people. I had friends who were lost their jobs saying things like that. In fact, one is continuing his court case, Ward Churchill, and has just lost an appeal again. You know, saying, trying to understand what happened, and it's true, Ward used very strong language, language I would not use. But nevertheless, in trying to explain, the pressure is immense. You cannot explain, because they will say to you, to explain is to explain away which is another way to say justify. Mm -hmm. But how can you understand something unless you explain it? How can you know how to create a strategy to deal with something unless you understand it? You cannot fight against something unless you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, everything scares you. Even somebody who you think looks like a terrorist. Even somebody who wants to create a mosque, which on the surface is not what attacked you. Mosques don't attack people. <laughs> you know, mosques are not able to fly up in the air and threaten you. But if you don't have a theory, you're going to blame the mosque. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the opening section of this, and then we can have a conversation. All right? Now, I'll tell you, the book is called Uncle Swami for several reasons. Um, one is not because Uncle Sam is buried up the road here. <laughs> well, that would be a good good reason. <laughs> Uncle Sam is buried here. Yeah. I suggest that on his death day, you should have a procession. Yeah. <laughs> no, Uncle Sam, yes, but not quite. 
In the 1950s, one of my favorite writers, Pakistani writer Sadat Hassan Manto, wrote a series of satirical letters called Letters to Uncle Sam. And they would all begin, you know, and they would tell Uncle Sam, look, I'm this Pakistani guy. We made this huge agreement with you. We signed this pact. We entered CENTO. You know, the CENTO was a central treaty organization. It included Iraq, Iran, right. Pakistan, United States, yeah. Turkey. We joined CENTO. We are your main allies here. Please, can I go for a date with Judy Garland? I, I mean, I don't know who the star was. He would write like this, you know. You haven't given me anything. I have no job. I have no money. I never eat your cheese. At least let me go on one date with Judy Garland. It's very funny letters. He wrote seven of them. Some funnier than others. They're of the time. I loved, I've always loved those letters because they are so funny in their sense. So I was thinking of Manto on the one hand. Other thing I was thinking about was, no longer is Uncle Sam that elderly man with a white beard. Now Uncle Sam can come in different guises. Sometimes he can look like Bobby Jindal. You know, sometimes he can look like Elaine Chow, former Secretary of Labor. Uncle Sam doesn't have to be that guy, emaciated. Uncle Sam can be like Chris Christie. You know, <laughs> Uncle Sam is different. Now he can be a Swami. <laughs> so that's, that was Uncle Swami. I'll read you the opening. It's called Letter to Uncle Sam. Dear Uncle Swami, it has been 10 years since the planes crashed into your buildings. It was a shock to your system. You were not used to such things. It didn't break your heart. It sharpened your rage. Like an exhausted dragon, you whipped your tail around, reaching, crashing into other buildings, those in far off Kabul and Kandahar, Mazar-e-Sharif and Herat, later Baghdad and Basra, and your feet stomped on your own ground, crushing Balbir Singh Sodhi and Gurcharanjit Singh Anand, Imran Tahir and Abdul Abulain, Ahmad Abulain. These latter are just names sitting patiently in your computer systems, either in mortuary registers or deportation files. The people behind them are shadows. You smiled at them when they served you your curries and patted their backs when they delivered their assignments on time. But you didn't really care about them, what they were made of, their moral compasses. Planes crash, people are smashed here and there, there and here. Please do not take my blunt words to heart, uncle. You have been good to me. You have been good to many of us. But why does my stomach still clench when somebody with a badge approaches me, thinking in my churned head that my time has come? I am going to be led to a plane and sent back to where I came from. Is it because that badge has started stopping me more often these past 10 years? Asking me why I am here, where I am, who I am, where I am going, what I believe in. Who are these people with badges, uncle? And why do they stare at me? I have heartburn, uncle. I will take to drink. I will take to drugs. I will take to watching TV, <laughs> eating fast food, going into debt. I will not exfoliate. I will not eat salad. I will not read the newspaper. I cannot wear my headscarf. I cannot grow my beard. I cannot speak my name and allow its poetry to ring through the air. You send American aid all around, throwing money and cheese at the world's poor. Even that aid is money you have borrowed from others. Lords are thieves whose theft is pro proper. Um, to Muslims, I believe, in Iran. And they utilized their news service to their advantage. At the time, it was just, I think it may have been Joseph Reuters, something like that, James Reuters, Joseph, anyway. So they manipulated the news to benefit their corporate interests. This is in the early years. 100 years later, it seems quaint that somebody owns media themselves and manipulates the news for their own benefit. 
Now the media manipulates the news for the whole class's benefit. It's a little more sophisticated and generous. You don't need to own it yourself. But so the name Reuters in Iran is associated with, you know, you fomented political trouble. People will say, hey, hence Reuters, to advantage yourself in oil contracts. And that's the association. So Kermit Roosevelt, you overthrew our government. Reuters, you manipulated the news to your benefit. <laughs> so they stand in for big histories of disenfranchisement. Yeah, please. Um, could you talk a little bit about how they're using, they're exploiting the divisions between Sunni and Shia, and what you know, what this is really about? This is a, this is two kinds of stories. If you believe some people, it's a very old story. It goes back, you know to the origins of Islam, and there's a divine name. Forget that. There are originary stories, they are not so important. More interesting is the politics more recently. In 1979, 78 actually was the beginning of the Iranian revolution. It has an earlier history, but 78 it was a mass revolution. In 79, it turns that it's demonstrated increasingly that political power is going to go to the hands of the clerics. They had the most organized force. The left was strong, powerful. Northern Iran, uh, oil workers, you know, they had strong railway workers, very strong unions. But they were not able to capture enough authority. When Khomeini returns from Paris, you know, there are thousands, million people maybe on the roads to greet him. So they delivered the revolution to the clerics. Now, one thing about the Iranian revolution was it saw itself as deeply anti-monarchical. That was its self-perception. Mm -hmm. That monarchy, time of monarchs is gone. Mm -hmm. It is the time of, you know, vilayati faqi, the rule of the clerics, mm -hmm. not the rule of monarchs. You know, in a sense, it's an advance, but not very much of an advance, but anyway. OK, that was the th thinking. Very soon after the Iranian revolution, in the Arab countries, that is, sorry, the Gulf Arab countries, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, there was a very keen understanding that the main threat was against them. So the Gulf Arab states will create a group in 1981 called the Gulf Coordination Council. And they will begin to assert authority. They basically finance Saddam Hussein to go to war against Iran. That was an unprovoked war. Iraq will go to war against Iran. And by the way, in 1990, the war ended in 1988-89. Iran-Iraq war went on for eight years. Mm -hmm. When the war ended, Saddam turned back to the Gulf Arabs and said, pay me back. My country has been devastated by the war I fought for you. Mm -hmm. The Gulf Arabs said, no, he invades Kuwait. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the rift now within the world of the Arab bulwark against Iranian republicanism. So there has been a long-standing clash between the Gulf Arab states mm -hmm. and Iranian republicanism. Now, at one level, you can say it's a Shia-Sunni divide. It is that. Mm -hmm. But it's also a divide between republicanism and monarchy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, both are there. So those who characterize it simply as a sectarian war, they want to make this a medieval conflict. This is a conflict about the organization of power today. But as I say, it's also about you can inflame people's sectarian sense. Who is a real believer? Who is not a believer? Again, we are familiar with that, are we not? Mm -hmm. After all, in this country, for so long, there was a major divide between Catholics and Protestants. Some people think Mormons are not real Christians today even. Mm -hmm. Similar things occur there. But what has inflamed the question is the question of organization of political power. So even today, the big clash is between Iran and the Gulf countries. That is a major divide, major fall line. And that continues. That continues into other countries, you know? Even in the Gulf countries, like Bahrain, you have a very large, poor Shia population. Saudi Arabia, the Shia population is in the area of the oil. So all of this is also linked to control of resources. Correct. I mean, in, but in Saudi Arabia, see, interesting thing. Nobody talked about the Day of Rage protests 
in Saudi Arabia during the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we didn't talk about it is the guy who set up the Facebook site was shot outside his house the day after the site went live. Mm -hmm. Where was that reported? I didn't see any New York Times outrage. Mm -hmm. The arrests of what, some three, four hundred organizers that very day. Mm -hmm. That was not reported here because remember the Carter Doctrine. The defense of the realm of Saudi Arabia is identical to the defense of the United States. We are not going to make too much noise about Saudi Arabia's monarchy. You know, they, we'll talk about the dictatorship in Syria. No doubt it's a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. But Saudi Arabia is also a dictatorship. You commit a crime, you can get your hand chopped off, you know. Let's be serious. If we're going to have one standard, why is it applied so poorly? Because actually we don't do foreign policy by some idealistic standard. That's just the BS press releases that come from the State Department. Actual foreign policy is done cynically. That is where people don't actually see the United States as the city on the hill. You know, the only city on the hill is in the self-delusion of the press releases. And then our media here are stenographers. Mm -hmm. They print those press releases like it's reporting. Mm -hmm. They think they are real journalists. Actually, they are basically court stenographers. Right. They don't ask any questions. You know, I read in the New York Times the following classic statement. When Frank Wisner Jr. was sent as Obama's envoy to talk to Mubarak, the New York Times reported that he had he had had a meeting with the Saudi leadership about the democratic transition in Egypt. I mean, how can you report that with a straight face? How can the Americans have a conversation about the Arab Spring with the Saudis? <laughs> what will the Saudis contribute to a discussion about democracy? You know, were they explaining how to crush the rebellion? Because they're good at that. I mean, they cannot help you with talking about transitions. They're not interested in transitions. <laughs> so I'm, I just I don't want to say there is no Shia Sunni right. issue. That is an issue. But that's not what is fundamentally driving this. What's driving this is a major power game right. in the Middle East. Some people are calling this the regional Cold War. I think that's exaggerating. And so many examples can be given of that. Why did the Saudis send the, one of the favored palace princes to represent Saudi Arabia in Tehran during this non-aligned meeting? Mm. They boycotted the Arab League meeting in Iraq over the summer. And yet, two weeks ago, the favored prince goes to Tehran. It's not as simple as, oh, they hate each other. It's a very complicated, nuanced relationship. But it gets exaggerated. And it gets exaggerated on the ground as sectarian. Right. And that gets, that's dangerous. I mean, it's true, the Salafi groups in Libya had raised some Sufi shrines. You know, that is hurtful. Those are historical shrines. People look highly to them. But again, let's not take that and say, oh my god, they are destroying shrines. Mm -hmm. You know, that has happened right through world history. Of people who are heterodox believers are always tormented. People who believed in you know, spiritual things, they were called witches, maybe, or whatever. So we have done that to each other forever, yeah. I understand what you're saying, but, but so how do the people on the ground there perceive these differences between Sunni and Shia? It depends what you're talking sure, about, sure, where you're talking, which sure, context, sure, you know, sure, that kind of thing. I mean, for instance, in, let's say, in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, Lebanon is a society which is deeply sectarian. Mm -hmm. That is, the state is organized in a sectarian manner. Mm -hmm. So all political authority, everything is canalized on sectarian grounds. So Lebanon is a deeply sectarian society. Hezbollah is the party of the Shia. That's not because the Shia are inward looking only, you know, it's because the society was organized on sectarian grounds. That is, the politics were divided like that. Maronites get this post, yeah. you know, Shia gets this post, Sunni gets this post. I mean, if you organize society like that, you're always going to be divided. So that's how it works there. In other societies, it may not be as pointed. In, in Iraq, for instance, post Saddam Iraq, there is, I think, the possibility of a new kind of politics in the region. It's a majority Shia population, but there's a very large Sunni population. 
substantial and wealthy population, they are going to have to find a way to have a political entente. I think they have come to the understanding and all the parties now are slowly mixing. They, Maliki doesn't want his party to be the Shia party. That is, they know unhealthy. That is the Lebanon route. So let's see how these societies develop. In Syria, the Ba'ath regime from very early on understood the advantages again of canalizing communities. You know, you, you say this community can be the general in this battalion, this community general. That sort of communalist thinking is very dangerous. And which is why now in Syria, the caste of the rebellions looks sectarian a little bit. Even though in the local coordination committees, they insist we are not sectarian. So it's a complex, I can't give you one answer sure, because each sure. context, the thing is different. It's a soup. Yeah, right, please. Right. It's a big subject, but um, the noise in the media now for maybe since 1979, but certainly since 9-11 uh, on Iran is, is just horrifying. But, uh, and, and the noise has really picked up of late. I'd be interested in your take on where we really are, the Israeli, US, Iranian situation, where you see it likely to head regardless of who wins this presidential election. I mean, let's just first say that Israel is a nuclear power nation. You know, it is not a declared nation because they have kept a position of what they call ambiguity. But very good evidence has said they have maybe 200 weapons. Let's say 100. Let's say one. What does, does it make a difference? It's a nuclear nation. That's one, just to keep on the table. Second thing to keep on the table is in order to break the link between India and Iran during the Bush administration, <laughs> They allowed India, India tested its nuclear weapons for a second time in 1998. First test was in 74. Second test in 1998. They tested a second set of nuclear weapons. So in the 2000s, in the Bush administration, he began a process which became the India-US nuclear, civilian nuclear agreement and with the Hyde Amendment ratified by Congress. So the United States essentially brokered India's access to nuclear material through the Nuclear Suppliers Group. At the same time, because they wanted India to vote with the United States in the International Atomic Energy Agency. India plays an influential role in the non-aligned movement, the bulk of the world's country. So they, that influence would have been great. If India voted against Iran, it would say it's not just an American thing. That was the theory. But take a step backwards. India is not a signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. India is outside the Comprehensive Test Ban Agreement. India has refused to participate in any inspection regime. So the United States made a deal with a country that illegally twice tested nuclear weapons, not nuclear energy, cycle, fuel cycle. We're not talking about fuel cycle. Twice tested nuclear weapons made a nuclear agreement, got the major nuclear suppliers group, the NSG, which is all those you know, P5 European countries, they're all part of the NSG, including. All of them ratified India's allowance to get nuclear material. At the same time, Iran is a signatory of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and has had its whole process validated by the International Atomic Energy Agency. There are inspectors on the ground. So firstly, Israel is a nuclear state. It has weapons, ambiguity. Second, Iran has done this legally. Right. India did it illegally, but was ratified. I'm coming to the politics of it. The third thing is, why is it that Iran should not go this route? Now, they claim that Iran does not have a moral right to nuclear weapons. India has a moral right. Right? Because India has not threatened any country. Forget that Pakistan feels existentially threatened by the presence of India. <laughs> okay, India hasn't threatened any country. Why is there a moral problem with Iran? Because the Ahmadinejad government, because Ahmadinejad himself is buffoonish as a politician, the Ahmadinejad government has said things that are dangerous. 
Therefore, he has got no moral right to nuclear. Now, the problem is the non-proliferation treaty and the IAEA does not have a moral standard. There is no character certificate. <laughs> you simply have to go through this inspection <laughs> regime because that was part of, you may remember reading about Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace proposal. So this is an, what Iran is doing is Eisenhowerian. It's following the Eisenhower procedure. Now, obviously, they fight with the inspectors. Let me tell you something funny about inspectors, it, because it makes the point. I was told recently that in the United States, pet shops are inspected without a warning. But hospitals get 12 hours. Did you hear that? 12 hour warning. Yeah, I, I thought that was amazing. You care more for the pets than for the human beings. <laughs> they get 12 hours to throw all the garbage and open the exit doors and I don't know. Everybody resists inspection. How many of you work for a place where it says, bring on the inspectors? Nobody says, bring on, I mean, unless you're an inspector. <laughs> then you say, yes, bring on the inspector. I agree. I know some of you have those hats. So that's part of the issue. Now, everybody around the world, including this NAM meeting in Tehran, which validated Iran's right to nuclear material, everybody realizes there is a real discrepancy in the arguments made against Iran. Now, if the argument is that the countries whose politics we don't like should not have the right to a weapon, well, then just let's articulate that policy. Mm -hmm. Then let's just make it plain that if we don't like your politics, you cannot have a nuclear weapon. But that's a different standard than saying that you are doing an illegal thing. The current IAEA report, the one that just came out, it was amazing. David Sanger, fantastic journalist at the Times, reported on that IAEA document. The headline said X, Iran moving towards completion of fuel cycle, blah, blah, blah. Right? Everything in the front of the story, buried toward the back of the story, was the sentence which said, that at this level, they, what they have, they cannot make a bomb for 20 years. Yeah. That was in the IEA report. It was buried in the New York Times story. The headline should have been, IEA says, Iran, at the current thing, will never be able to make a bomb in 20 years. They didn't make that the headline. The headline was, Iran is on the threshold. So you see the point I'm making is that this is about politics. And I would like them to say, we don't like your politics. You're not allowed a bomb. That's honest. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is hypocritical. Mm -hmm. And the greatest hypocritical thing is India sitting in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to hypocrisy, could you explain the distinction between uh, NATO's interest in Libya versus you know, our disinterest in, uh, in Syria? Well, I mean, the obvious answer, of course, is the oil revenue. Yeah. That's the obvious one. And now he would sell to yeah. anyone, and he would. know that, and he was making deals with BP. With everybody. Yeah, and, and, and of course, the oil is in Serenica. So, it, you know, indeed, you could destabilize the whole country. Before Mussolini, it was two countries. No, before the Italians. It was two vilayets yes. in the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Three vilayets, but yeah, yeah, three districts. Yeah. So I mean I, I just don't I don't quite get it why uh, you know Gaddafi who had capitulated basically to everything that the uh, that the U.S. wanted had made the oil deal obviously with Britain uh, we decide to bomb him he's expendable and for some reason I mean he has done renditions also we have done nothing against Assad except the little hand wringing I don't get it actually let's. Uh you should read my book. <laughs> the whole book is the answer. In the second half is essentially an answer. One of the, I'll just make one point and then we'll go. That is that in international relations, people like me, you know, we don't, we underestimate the role of personal animosity. I mean, the Saudi king, Abdullah hated Gaddafi. At a meeting in Doha, Qatar, Gaddafi takes the podium. And he was, even when he was making deals with the West, he was still a lunatic. He sits there, stands there, and he points to the king of Saudi Arabia and the presence of the host, the Emir of Qatar, and he says to him, 
You are a creation of the British and a lapdog of the Americans. <laughs> well, you can watch that on YouTube. <laughs> and the uh, Saudi king, you know, who has one of those gigantic, bigger than my face, just glaring at him. And the Emir of Qatar just glaring at him, you know. He was deeply hated by the Gulf Arab states. So, you know, we like to think there's always a very, in, you know, but these are monarchies. They don't need complicated reasons. I don't like you off with your head. I mean, it's Alice in Wonderland, you know. <laughs> so, sometimes we want to overanalyze things. You know, they wanted Gaddafi gone from the mid, you know, from the 1960s. He was always a liability. Even when he was their friend, his tongue was unruly. <laughs> he was always a barbarian from Sirt. You know, uneducated, small town, provincial fellow. He was a barbarian. Even a barbarian who's collaborating with you is expendable. Uh -huh. So, but the real explanation is in my book. Yes, please. Um, what do you think about the prospects for North African countries to eventually do things that might help the people, help the economy? Do you think it is hopeful or not? Of course it's hopeful. We are human beings. Yeah. I mean, we wake up every day and pretend yesterday didn't happen. <laughs> you know, that's how we survive. <laughs> no, that, I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah. Good things will come. They have to. We have to live like that. But in the short term, I mean, good things will eventually come. In the short term, there are positive developments. You know, Tunisia is a hugely positive development. Ben Ali was a crook. His in-laws, the Trabulsi family, they had a vacuum pump into the treasury of Tunisia running all the way to Switzerland. Yeah. That has ended. People feel empowered. They feel energetic. Even in Egypt. See, in Egypt, it was always the case that in the first flush of the end of Mubarak, the Brotherhood was going to have political power. The liberals were not organized. And anyway, liberals don't typically have a good mass base. You know, because the workers don't trust the liberal parties, unlike in the United States. <laughs> where the workers are so committed to the re-election of the liberal party that they don't look at their own interests first. But anyway. Okay. So the textile workers of Mahalla, the my favorite union in Egypt is named the Union of uh, of Tax Employees. Now you may think, ah, these are people who work in the tax department. But no, these are state employees. They get paid by tax. So they're tax employees. <laughs> the, it was the only independent union in Mubarak's Egypt. Very militant union. So these unions were not going to go with the liberals, with Ayman Noor and Barade and others. They don't trust them. But they don't have their own political formation yet. So as the Islamists come to power and govern like neoliberals, if the unions are doing their job, which they have been doing, they're expanding their bases, hopefully a political party will emerge that will represent them. That is going to come in Egypt inevitably. Because they were the base of the revolution. These textile workers, state employees, port workers in Port Said, in Suez, school teachers in Alexandria. You know, in the initial phase, they some of them will have put their faith voting. But even in this presidential election, the Nazarite came almost close. Third. He was third. He almost beat Ahmad Shafiq, the candidate of Mubarakism. The Nazarite did much better than people assumed. And I think a lot of workers would have voted there rather than the Brotherhood, the organized worker. So we'll see in Egypt. You know, in these countries, there are lots of social forces. The main thing is we need to have faith in the people. Mm -hmm. Libya too, you think, is going in the I believe. To a coup d'etat, or people will lose faith in you. So many positive regimes all around the third world. They took power and created one-party states. They either got knocked off in a coup d'etat, like Ben Bella in Algeria, or they lost the people's trust, like in Krumah's Ghana, just to take the neighboring countries of Libya. So if you don't create a proper democratic process, you're going to, so in Libya from 69 to now, there's been no effective civil society. 
no effective democratic process. So give the Libyans a chance. You know, now my fear is two warships have gone off the coast of Libya. The drones are flying over eastern Libya. We start bombing there again, it's mayhem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that mayhem, my God, already Syria can have a regional conflagration. Yeah. You start bombing in eastern Libya, Egypt is gone. So my real hope is, you know, the current American government doesn't get caught in a corner of being branded as the Chamberlains of the 21st century. You know, this language of why you are appeasing them. It's a very dangerous language. Firstly, it makes Islam or Arabs into Nazis. You know, when Romney said, don't appease them. Who's the them that you're not supposed to appease? The Arabs? Then the Arabs are Nazis. Then you have to just kill them all. You know, I used to joke with my students during the Iraq war. I said, you know, it would be so much cheaper if we're spending trillions of dollars on the war. It'll be cheaper just to kill everybody. It'll be far cheaper. Of course, then it chills people. You know, how many people is it acceptable to kill? In Iraq, the figures run between 200,000 and 1 million as a consequence of the war. Between 200,000 is the low number, and a million plus is the high number. That's the Lancet's number. Hmm? How many people is it acceptable to kill in a country of 23 million? One out of 23 million, two out of 23 million, three, four, five million? How many you want to kill? So an ambassador has been killed. It's a great tragedy. Let there be an investigation. Find the people who fired it. Don't start bombing Eastern Libya. <coughs> you know, bombing is not a police action. That was something Bill Clinton used to like to do in Afghanistan. Anything happened around the world, he would send cruise missiles into Afghanistan or into Iraq. You may remember this in the 90s. You know, he got into trouble in the White House. Next thing we hear, <laughs> cruise missiles in Afghanistan. Yeah. Remember that movie, Wag the Dog? Yes. yes. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm taking in all that you're saying about the foreign policy and, and the Middle East with, with great happiness because I'm getting educated um, about it. I but don't trust me. That's the thing. <laughs> well, I have a comment to offer from the perspective of being a, a public relations person. I work with several groups you know, around here and nationally um, on Muslim issues, I guess you would say. Of course, that includes the political issues that you're talking about, not only, you know, in the Middle East, but as represented by American Muslims, who are, many of whom are immigrants, but who, who are Americans as well as non-Muslims, who are perhaps like all of us, you know, pretty far left and, and very interested in the great inequities that we see. And one observation that, that I have from, from doing this, and I, I may be wrong, but this you know, conflagration now that, that has erupted in the past couple of days kind of focus it. I'm not sure that Americans can make a distinction between the political aspects of Islamic countries and Islam. When those get fused, and you referred to it a couple of times, you know, people don't understand the politics, they don't understand Islam. It's almost a fusion there. This don't work with Americans because part of what is guaranteed to us here is the freedom of religion. Indeed, that is why so many immigrants have come. Um, you know, to be able to, to, to have that freedom, you know, First Amendment, et cetera, et cetera, and that's where that's, that's going to go. That's the consequence, then, I think, of having to make the distinction between politics and religion. What seems to me to be missing um, is the role of the hatred and the Islamophobia that has that is indeed a significant part of what has been then transported seemingly from America to to the Middle East, and maybe maybe I have the 
the problem or you know I'm not understanding something but I think they are in Americans minds I think they're two different things but let me ask you a question I, I actually think it's not that hard to understand because we deal with this ourselves somebody will say for instance that uh, any abortion is an abomination that is a religious position that enters political discourse somebody will say no you cannot have this taught in school. You cannot teach you know, in, uh, evolution. Those become political fights. Mm -hmm. So why is it that we ourselves every day tolerate this particular political discussion? We live with it. That's what I mean by we tolerate it. We live with it. It's all around us. Major political parties articulate a religious politics into the question of health care. Right? Into the question of insurance. It's there with us. So what I would say is, if we have normal, had made normal the preponderance of a religious position in our normal political debate, in our everyday political debate, why is it so stunning hmm. that in Egypt there will be religion in politics? So that's why I actually think that it's not about Americans can't get religion in politics or whatever. What I think is terrifying is the idea of Islam. Yes. Yeah. Because the exactly. question of religion in politics exactly. is something we negotiate all the time. Right. I mean, you know, again, I live in Massachusetts. Even in Massachusetts, politicians will say, well, I'll go everywhere, but I, on this whole choice thing, I can't, oh, homosexuality or gay marriage, you know, that offends me. Mm -hmm. You know, people will talk like that openly. I'm offended by gay marriage. Civil unions is okay, but marriage is of. What are you talking about? I personally don't understand where you're coming from. I'm trying my best. But I don't get your frames of reference. I don't know what this word abomination means. I don't get it. It's like the word smote. It seems dated to me. These seem like they came from another era. It comes from that time. But you believe it today. So in that context, Sure, there's a cleric who says, this is an abomination. Abomination against Islam. Mm -hmm. You will be smote for your belief. <laughs> Understand, it's the same kind of thing. But I think what happens is we suddenly say, well, it's an acceptable debate to have. If a Christian says, I worry about abortion, that's an acceptable thing. But if a Muslim says, I worry about this, it's like, oh my God, they are so medieval. <laughs> So I think this has to do, in a sense, with our problem with Islam. And so there's, there's so much that, at base, is Islamophobic, or at least a fear, or at very least trying to be as, as level as possible. Or discomfort with Islam. Mm -hmm. or discomfort. Just a simple, you know, I don't know what this thing is. I, I fear it. You know, it's like, it's a little bit like, you know, what's that thing? Uh, that fly bites you and you get that thing, it's coming now again. West Nile, do I wear a long shirt to protect? How much thing can I put on? You know, how do I protect against this Sharia thing? People don't know what they're talking about. You're out of your mind. If that mosquito bites you, you'll get it. I mean, I don't know if a long sleeve shirt is actually going to help you. But your prejudice and fear is not going to help you be protected from Sharia because, you know, it's an illusion. Your real worry has got to be this. For you, in this context, the real worry is, well, you know, your healthcare is no longer going to support contraception. <laughs> that should be a real worry. Right. So what, what, do you have suggestions as far as how to begin there? I, I always say, my friend, always bring it home. Right. When somebody says, oh my God, they're doing this, I well, say, look, that reaction, my God, let's normalize that, not right. distance it. Let's not always make the, their problems are othering. Right. Look how bizarre they are. They believe these bizarre things. Really, it's that bizarre? I don't think so. If somebody starts painting some offensive things in front of a synagogue or a church, right. people will be offended. You know what I started with? That point? We should always humanize. Now, that doesn't mean I agree with it. Somebody says, I don't like Salman Rushdie's book. I say, you're out of your mind. 
First read the book. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I say what you're reacting to is not the book. What you're reacting to is centuries of humiliation. Deal with that. Let's, have a, let's try to build and have a much more mature response mm -hmm. to denigration. You know, but the, so in other words, just by understanding it is not to justify it. Remember that point again. I go to Joe in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on these um, attacks on the uh, embassies, uh, uh, what I'm noticing from Muslims that I work with in the anti-war movement, who are in some ways the more bold Muslims in the Muslim community, they were able to come out and take stands against war and, and so forth, because they've all retreated. Um, and they're all putting out statements on condemning these attacks. There shows they're scared. And I, I think what it will lead to is further attacks on Muslims in this country of different kinds, uh, whatever uh, um, it will be. But we have to understand that the, this Islamophobia is not just um, something that comes out of the air, that there's a reason for it, there's a political reason for it, and it is fostered by the United States of America um, on us. Uh, there's all these things that have happened, such as the cases that we know about in, in um, Albany and other places where they send FBI agents into the mosques to get people, to bribe them, to fool them, to say something um, that can be indictable, and then even have phony trials where fake evidence that you can't uh, look at and, and so forth. That's for a purpose. That's to say Muslims are bad. Muslims are evil. So you could justify wars against Muslims and justify attacks on civil liberties here on all of us. And of course, say that we stopped an attack. Yeah, but yeah. then, right, and say things like that. But then there's the Peter King hearings, mm. and then uh, um, Pam there's Geller. about 13 states throughout this country. There's these anti-Sharia laws that have now come into effect. Mm -hmm. These are government um, attempts to bring about this Islamophobia. So when they say, oh, here's a stupid video, and there's a stupid video, but that's just an isolated person. It comes in the context of this. We gave permission for this. You know, in the early days of the Iraq War, uh, YouTube wouldn't put up some anti-war um, uh, uh, videos on YouTube. But this video is still up there, except for in certain places around the world. Egypt, it's, you cannot see it in yeah, Egypt. It, it's still, it's still up there. Um, yeah. You know, so what we have to do, the non-Muslims in this room, the anti-war activists, the civil liberties activists, the labor activists in this room, is we have to do what the Muslims can't do right now. And we have to say that. We have to say there's this anti-Islam, um, there's this Islamophobia, there's this anti-Islamic sentiment that has been um, uh, fostered on the population of this country and these wars against Islamic people. And it was inevitable at some point to break out. You can't divorce this and say it was because of the stupid video, because that's taking uh, the whole you know, thing off the, where it should be belong, where it belongs. So we have to be a little bolder in this period and go out and start challenging this in the newspapers and our classrooms and whoever is the FBI agent in the room, just remember when you take notes of this meeting, Joe is saying that, not me. <laughs> Don't just take the notes and forget to write that it's Joe. Okay? You can indict me for everything else. <laughs> just make sure you take him away. Just one or two more. Yeah, please. He, he's making an important point. I didn't mean to, to, to mark his point. He's making a very important point. Of course he is. The fact is, I'll come back to you. Right after 9-11 as well, you know, it was people in my community, other communities that bought giant flags and put them in front of store windows. And that was not out of a sudden burst of patriotism. It was out of fear, you know. I write in the Uncle Swami that it's not that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Sometimes patriotism is the first refuge of a target. You know, so, yes, please. Oh, I guess, what I usually say is in opposition to Joe. Good God. Okay, but, and, 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 and uh, I am a research paleontologist. And over a career, it has been really depressing to see Americans 
reject rational arguments. <laughs> in the newspapers, evolution. Your name is Dave? No, Ed Landing. Ed, did you write to me? No. Somebody called Dave wrote to me and said, must yeah, talk about science. Oh, that was good. Okay. okay. But, Dave or Dan? But really, you know, oh. over the years, I mean, you do and you see this um, pretty much rejection of let's evaluate rational arguments. And so creationism remains, you know, as something, you know, the belief here, or do you believe in evolution? It's a choice. Yeah. No, but I don't believe <laughs> in evolution. We have the evidence for it, and I don't believe in gravity. But right. the, there was a poll very recently that said that if a scientist, this was a month ago, if a scientist gave, proved, gave you the evidence that the Bible was, cre was correct in creation, would you believe him? 80% in the poll said no. That's so really, Americans, <laughs> Americans cannot deal with facts. No, with scientists. scientists. With scientists. <laughs> Actually, what that demonstrates is nobody trusts scientists. They trust members of Congress before scientists. <laughs> Part of the elite not to be believed in. But Only 20% of you are trusted. <laughs> no, but I, I, what I'm really saying is that I don't think Americans can catch the subtlety of these arguments of Islam versus uh, uh, what is happening in, the, you know, in the various countries. I think that really Muslims have to s solve this. And the way you solve this in America is with money. And you have a lot of Shiites in Los Angeles, in Dearborn. They have to start buying Congress. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, this is the only way that it can be done. There is no popular argument that can be made for more Americans. But here's the interesting thing is I actually don't accept the view that Americans don't get it. I, I go, at least I speak maybe two or three times a week in different gatherings. Uh -huh. Now, you will say, well, everybody who comes to the uh -huh. things you speak there, that's not true. I speak in all kinds of spaces, in schools, in different places. And I find that I'm not saying believe this line. I'm saying argue with me. Yeah, I'm saying here's uh -huh. what I'm saying to you, argue with me. If you want to think they are monsters, fine. Then the next strategy is you have to kill them all. Hmm. What is your strategy to deal with the zombie? <laughs> you know, etc. Right? Argue with me. So I think, I feel like if we are more open in our conversations with each mm -hmm. other, mm -hmm. if we're less scared, mm -hmm. If we, don't, if we don't have faith in people who live around us, you know, mm -hmm. Americans, mm -hmm. if we don't have faith, if we don't challenge people, if we don't have those conversations, if we don't push people along the lines of that pole, why would people, you know, that's a great starting of a conversation. Mm -hmm. We have to have faith in people. If I say we have to have faith in the Libyan people, I of course have as much faith in the American people. I don't say Americans are not going to get this. I will always say that is our struggle. Mm -hmm. That is where we have to be fighting. Those are the conversations we must have. Otherwise, a very long time ago, I would have turned tail and gone elsewhere. Right. But we have to. Last question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have this short story that confirms that. I went to Iran. And when I came back, I went everywhere and talked about it. And some people attacked me verbally, screamed, went crazy. Oh, it's Sharia, and, you know, and but I didn't stop. But the best experience I had, I went to, it was a joint middle school, high school in a very rural, conservative part of upstate New York. And I had these kids, and I showed photographs. And here were their questions. Do they smoke? Do they have sex? Um, <laughs> do they get to drive cars? Uh, do they get, you know, do they have jobs? I mean, they looked at these kids, and I had pictures of them, you know, Iranian girl with her headscarf and a cell phone. They felt connected. They looked at them. These are, these are kids like us, and what is their life like? And that, for me, was really eye-opening, because I think we tend to make assumptions that uh, everybody is, you know, they, they hate Islam, they hate these people, that, and I think we have to break, break through that and face it, and then people start to hear you. 
I agree. I'll make two quick comments and we'll close. One is progressives are too defensive, too scared of engaging with people. Mm -hmm. People are people. We shouldn't get go inside the turtle shell and say, let's talk, you know. Mm. We need to go out there, talk to people. People are nice, mm. you know. Don't be afraid of people. Second thing I'll say is the Emperor Hadrian used to lose his temper a lot. And one day he beat one of his slaves terribly and engorged, took his eye out. Mm. And afterwards, Hadrian, like many people who are violent, felt remorse. And he cried in his room. And then he called for the slave, and the slave came to his chamber, he was bandaged up. And he said to the slave, forgive me. And the slave said, you are the emperor, I am your slave. Obviously, I forgive you. That's, you know, of course I forgive you. Then he says, I will give you anything you want to earn your true forgiveness. And the slave said, give me back my eye. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>